I have a business shortcut confession to make, listener. When I needed TNCs and a privacy policy for my websites, I googled, found someone in a similar field and did the old copy-paste change business name trick. Now, when I told Heidi from Law by Design about this, she didn't make me feel embarrassed or uneducated. She laughed with me and said, don't worry, that's you and 90% of the small business community. We do what we've got to do to get going. But as we grow, there are important aspects we might need to tweak in order to effectively protect ourselves, our family and our assets. So I was stoked to find a fellow small business in Law by Design that's making quality legal advice affordable and accessible no matter how big, small or micro your business might be. They keep it simple with clear and practical advice, custom legal services, but also super helpful and ready to go legal templates. So if you're a consultant or maybe you have an e-com business, you can get a template that gives you privacy policies, TNCs, service agreements and loads more in like three clicks. Getting your legal sorted with someone who fully resonates with the experience of being a small business owner and has designed ways to make it easier for us just hits all the good business feels. So check out Law by Design, the law firm that exists to truly support small and growing businesses across Australia. They're at lawbydesign.com.au and because they love you and want to see you grow as much as I do, listener, you can get yourself 20% off any template with the code unemployedpod20. Check them out, Law by Design, who I am super proud to have supporting this show. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid, a podcast that explores the glorious mess of building your own business with the people doing it. I'm your host and fellow business builder, Kim Curtin. Thank you for being here. Let's get into some good, honest small business chat. Hello, business builder, which means I am also saying hello to you as a marketer, administrator, finance person, legal, customer service, research, all of the things you are and do to make your business a reality. Jeez, you are a superhuman. I've got an incredible conversation and business story for you today. Mike Halligan, co-founder of Scratch, an epic direct-to-consumer healthy dog food brand with a very impressive and inspiring story. But What I think will stand out to you in this conversation today is the reminder that when you commit to an action towards your business goal, just following the journey that's right in front of you and not being too attached to an end goal, what happens next is nothing short of incredible. You'll also hear about what assessing a market opportunity actually looks like, the way one business leads to another, the potential in quote unquote boring categories, being forced into a business before you planned on it recognizing your strengths and finding the right business partner to fill the gaps, teaching yourself to learn what you need to know as you go, becoming a successful people leader as well as a business owner, no pressure, and the role of strong brand-led content in cut-through marketing. There is one part as well where we get into the depths of how to make it all work financially. So trying to balance the phase of not paying yourself while hustling in, say, consulting to make money on the side, as in Mike's story, or all while scaling up and taking on staff in your business. It's a hugely impactful part of the conversation. So make sure you stick around for all of it as you are guaranteed to fill the inspo. We did have some brief doggo interaction in the background of our chat for this one, but I thought, you know, if ever there's an episode to leave the doggoness in it, it is this one. It is a celebration of beautiful doggos and business building. So let's get into the chat. I'm here with Mike Halligan, co-founder of Scratch, a bootstrapped dog food company feeding Australia's healthiest kibble to over 40,000 amazing doggos. Scratch is the brain puppy of two little guys taking on the big guys. They both love dogs and hate that Aussies were getting charged mega bucks for dried dog food that was pretty average at best. So they decided to fix it from scratch, from the supply chain right down to how it's delivered. Their mission? To offer you a new breed of Australian-made dog food, one that's good for your dog, better for the planet and easier for you. They're an Australian-owned and made company with 97% of scratch sourced from local suppliers and using sustainable ingredients, are proudly independent and socially motivated, removing middle people and unnecessary markups while also donating 2% of their revenue towards environmental and dog welfare charities. And they're a certified B Corp. Since launch, they're well on their way in the mission of leading a new wave of dog food that puts dogs first, being featured in Broadsheet, Mamma Mia, The Project, Channels 7 and 9, and the recipient of Frankie Mag's Small Biz of 2019 just the year after they launched. 
So many of us set on a mission to create a business to make better things, to work on something valuable and achieve a semblance of autonomy while doing it. And for Mike with Scratch, dog food isn't the only thing they think needs fixing. Mike and the team believe work should be calm, rewarding and flexible. So deliberately keep things small and sustainable, work remote but Zoom often and always stop to pat dogs. You are absolutely speaking our language with this business of yours, Mike, and mine from the love of doggos. So I cannot wait to hear the story of building it. Welcome to Unemployed and Afraid. Thanks, Kim. Great to chat. Love talking dogs, love talking business. Two together is awesome. Absolutely. I do on the subject of dog talk, I just how much I actually talk to my dog in thinking that she can completely understand me and have full-blown uh, staff meetings, I would say, with my dog. it's um, I can relate to that. My partner just uh, went away for a week or so and I realised like as soon as she goes, I replace speaking to her with speaking to the dog so much more. It's easily done. And they're part of the household, right? You've got to include <laughs> yeah, them in the narrative. <laughs> On that, how do you think your adorable doggo, Mello, would describe you? Not forthcoming with treats, anywhere near enough, attached to a laptop too much, cuddly and fun sometimes as well. <laughs> Does your dog uh, do the nuzzle when the laptop is physically on the lap if you're, if you're ever working on the couch? No, he sort of is more of a side eye kind of dog. He'll just look at you and just go, no, no, the way you're, the way you're living and not giving me enough attention just doesn't quite work. He, he's not so much of like a nuzzer. He's just like a clear disapprover. I like that. Just a little bit of dog sass is what we all need in the daily. So before Scratch was this incredible business that you've created, you know, five and a bit years now, who were you? Uh, I was someone trying to learn and prove himself and uh, also like do work that really interested him. Um, I kind of like floated around a lot of consulting. Just I think that was like what for so many young people and super hungry people who love learning, but also like probably have control issues. It was, you know, consulting like was a really great way of learning, getting paid, meeting lots of people and really just soaking up how to go about business, either by just the act of having to show up and give people knowledge or share knowledge or work out problems with them. But often it's just sitting back and like learning what they're, uh, what they're good at and how they go about things. So I did a lot of sort of consulting. It started off in marketing and then it ended up in actually blog design of all things. Like I found this little niche making blogs for people and then that turned into making blogs for e-commerce brands and then that turned into making online stores for them and then that turned into applying the marketing advice with the online stores and so I kind of like that kind of rabbit hole of you do one thing and then that leads to just a small step to another thing and 50 small steps later you end up in a completely different place. So I found myself in the final few years before I started Scratch I found myself working actually in jobs uh, i ran digital marketing for a group of fashion brands and then i was general manager of a watch brand for a little bit so marketing businessy kind of stuff but all around this kind of e-commerce selling to a to consumer space and uh and then just trying to travel and live and be young at the same time and that was looking back i was trying to do it all but yeah ended up ended up you know i was a i was a happy person was able to learn a lot and very fortunate in the opportunities i was given and the the people I met along the way, definitely. I think you just described my business plan in that <laughs> just start doing one thing and then just do another thing and then let it lead to somewhere else yeah. and just kind of show I mean, up. I mean, if you work with great people, it sounds awesome. When I was researching you when we were talking prior to our uh, recording here today, there was something that stood out to me about your kind of pre-scratch journeys. You mentioned you studied entrepreneurship, but kind of moved away from it to go into this marketing journey that, that took you all through these interesting rabbit holes. I'm interested in what that field of study looks like for you and why you decided not to continue it. It definitely looked like showing up like one day a week to uni, which made it a real struggle. I was definitely like living at home in the outer suburbs, hated the hour commute into uni. So it was only really if I'd had a good sleep and was looking after myself. And as a 19 year old, it's, it was very rare for me to look after myself all that well. So I probably ended up going to uni like one day a week. And it was only really on this day where um, there, there was a marketing class in that where the, the lecturer I absolutely loved. I thought it was so inspiring. sort of like one of those people who really ignited a passion in me. So I'd go in those days that I had a class with him. And then at the end of that first year, I, I had to take a year off because I, wanted, I was going to go traveling for a few months. And then the course was so small. Entrepreneurship course at the time was so small that you had to take a full year off. You couldn't just like hop back in six months later. So I went to, you know, go back into the second year and they had kind of like stripped out a lot of the course and sort of made it a lot more of a generic business course. It shared a lot of the 
a lot of the classes were just generic business degree uh, and sort of lost a lot of that entrepreneurship uh, uniqueness to it. And uh, at the same time, that marketing professor, I wasn't going to have any, any lectures with him. So I was like, no, I actually don't want to do this and kind of use the fact that I was doing business consulting or marketing consulting in particular as the excuse to say, you know what, I'm actually like, I was sort of lying to myself because yeah, I do think there is a value of study, but I was learning a lot in business consulting and marketing consulting that I'm like, oh, I'll just double down on this and I'll learn this way and I'm sure it'll all work out. But most of it was just laziness. I just found that, that's, thank you for sharing because I was just thinking about the field of entrepreneurship as a study. I feel like I do it, you know, non-professionally or, or non-academically, just thinking about like the skills that people need to develop in this space and the skills that surprise you about this space that you have to develop and the stuff that challenges you. I just think like that field of entrepreneurship as a study would be something that I think could hold a lot of people's attention. So it's a shame that they're not looking at it from that part that marketing plays, the part that personal development plays. Plays, the part that your network plays, you know, all of those things with business is, is interesting. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it had, it had these moments where you're like, wow, this is so like, I would not eat for a week to, to be doing this as much as possible. But then like so much of it would also be super boring. And then, mm. you know, as much as I would like fall asleep in an accounting class, but then you would have this little glimmer where it's like, oh my God, this is so interesting. Like I remember there was one class where you had to break up into groups and there was a certain like business pitch you had to come up with. So it was like assessing market opportunities. And then you had to submit your pitch as a group for like the market opportunity. And then you would have them critiqued by the lecturer on stage. And, you know, that was daunting when, when you're young and not that confident. But it was also super interesting because you'd have this thing. You'd be like, you, you know, you'd be so in love with your idea as we are as entrepreneurs. And then you go up there and they'd say like, oh, well, they'd give you tips to show you how you haven't assessed the market properly. And this idea you thought was so good was probably very horribly positioned. Like I remember one was about uh, logbook tracking for car fleets. And this whole business premise was about SMSing in your Ks after every visit. And, you know, and just a simple thing like, okay, where, you know, how long is it going to take you to get up this idea? Where will technology be by that time? Where will it be in another three years? Who is in that space already? Who is already playing in the app space that would make you so redundant <laughs> from the moment. Like all these things that the first time you get into entrepreneurship, you're thinking right now, very immediate. And it sort of, you know, had these little glimmers where it like taught you about actually coming up with ideas that are thinking three steps ahead. And that was really, really nice. But unfortunately for every bit of that, there was also like p &L statements and, and all these things that looking back, I should have paid way too much attention to because I have to, still have to these days Google so much of basic business stuff. I'm so grateful for Google and YouTube and in business today because, yeah, don't worry, like you, I'm like, oh, Christ, i got to do, well, what is even that? Like, what does that mean? Gotta, I had a meeting with a lawyer this morning. I'm like, okay, I need to actually know what I'm asking for here. Let me just Google real quick what the terminology is for this thing that I'm asking. So, yeah, I get those bills. You mentioned there something really interesting that it would be remiss of me just to skim over for my interest in entrepreneurship study, which was this business of designing blogs, which is, you know, I guess pre-Instagram influencers as as you have described, what was that experience like getting out there and, and servicing that? And how did it end? Well, it ended that I sold it. Um, I sold it. There's a website called Fiverr where you can sell kind of online businesses. And I managed to sell it. I got about $35,000 for it, which I think the person way overpaid. But it, uh, it, was a good, like, it was a good little business. I was living in a share house with a few friends. I employed one of my friends to help me do it. Like there was just like every facet of being young and running a business that you didn't, it was actually a very average business, tough to scale. You didn't know what you're doing, but you just wanted to make it work and have a good time kind of thing. But through it, I got to design a lot. Like it, for me, everything was, every one of those businesses, like the marketing consulting before it was an opportunity to learn marketing strategy and to get given a challenge and learn along the way to then deliver hopefully a good outcome for the business. Blog design was learning how to design. I really loved design, but I wasn't great at it. I've never like, I'd never practiced it that much or studied it. But through like this model, we basically had this model was like $500 for a custom blog design. And so it was just a super simple customer premise. We got probably most of our customers actually in the US and then which were businesses. And then there was like authors in Australia and fashion bloggers and things like that. So I had this nice little mix, but I just like pump out blog designs. And then over time through that, I ended up templating layouts and then trying to make them feel all unique at the same point through artwork, font, color combinations, layering and, and different things. So that was kind of like my uh, get paid to learn to design. And then with that, I ended up, you have to actually 
turn that into a real life blog. The Photoshop files you've designed, you've got to turn actually into a blog. So from there, I learned how to do some very, very basic coding, but for the job, like for real front end coding. And I was, again, just getting paid to learn and figure that stuff out. And, you know, if you look back the hourly rate for some of it would have been like $10 an hour because I spent so much time learning. But yeah, like it really did throw myself into something I didn't know how to do, but was confident I could work it out. I really did just, you know, if I look back, open so many doors because these days my business runs on the platform that I was making blogs on back then. And I know how to do so many things through just like bit by bit learning from that stage, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So it's funny the things you do when you're young, just to put yourself in a learning position. It, some of them are like, it really is amazing how they end up helping you in ways you could never imagine. Amen to that. There is a ton of random skills I managed to develop over the years. I'm like, well, thank God I know how to do that <laughs> right now. So it, it take, I mean, scratch, what a, what a cool idea and what a cool business. I want to get to the, the place where the idea for this is starting to seed. So, you know, your entrepreneurial spirit clearly has never left you and it's just been kind of what's going to be the thing that's going to get your attention. So take me to the seed of the idea, uh, the first part and, and where you started exploring it. Yeah, sure. Well, the seed of the idea, I mean, so much of, I think, business comes from like your energy and what you're absorbing in the world. I actually I had really maybe a three year period, I mentioned where I was kind of working for other businesses. And that was actually a bit of a recuperation from running businesses, trying to like pay my bills and travel and stay, you know, and like grow up as well. Getting tired of being serious for a bit. I was kind of like a little bit burnt out from entrepreneurship and from like, for, I mean, entrepreneurship for me was mainly business consulting or marketing consulting, but it was still like, it kind of wears you down trying to do all the things and work out the world at the same time. And I, I actually had one startup that I tried. It was like a fitness app just before I was doing all these jobs and the jobs as much as it was for meeting people and having fun and learning and applying knowledge and someone who actually had budgets was like a way of just recuperating after that consulting and then startup idea. So after about three years, I started getting the energy back to say, I'm, I'm think I'm like, I'm ready to start something again. I'm kind of hungry again. And through those companies, I was able to work with great people, learn again, learn from them. And then was kind of, you know, in this e-commerce space as this direct to consumer kind of world was kind of taking off where brands were like the watch brand was a, basically an Instagram brand who went straight to a Shopify store and made lots and lots of money selling watches just through an Instagram account and a trend and a Shopify store. And so I was at this kind of like just getting exposed to this world of direct to consumer and what it could mean for businesses if you could market directly to a customer, not have to go through retailers, not have to necessarily make things in bulk and have hundreds and you know, thousands or millions of dollars of inventory just to get off the ground where you could just create an audience or you know anything like this. All this stuff was going on as the e-commerce world was kind of evolving. And then, um, yeah, I remember one day I just kind of just thought, oh, dog brands are so ugly. I think it was like looking at a pet barn category or something. And I'm like, the, the packaging, the, you know, like everything about this category is like, dogs are awesome. I like growing up with dogs all my life. I had two Cocker Spaniels at the time, Brandy and Sasha. And I'm like, this is a... This is a kind of tired old category. And it always, one of the things I learned from Balroy, in particular, like the wallet brand, Balroy, who amazing Australian success story out of Fitzroy and Bell's Beach, hence Balroy. They had, or Andy, the founder there, had spoken at an event that I was part of. And he was sort of talking about how a lot of the best businesses exist in like boring categories that people ignore. And, you know, you fast forward, you look at who gives a crap, the most boring category of all. And they've created just an incredible business, had an amazing amount of impact, creating great careers for people, product that lots of people love again super boring category wallets very boring category that wasn't done no one was focusing on wallets it was like the after accessory and so after having worked in fashion where i saw that things are just like you can have a great two years and then it can go just like the trend moves on people you know market moves i was like okay maybe there's something in this advice of like boring category and then yeah saw the dog food thing it kind of was just, i guess stewing away in the back of my mind for six months and then my dogs actually got sick uh, both of them kind of within six months they both got sick and unfortunately we lost them which was really really shit but i guess put dog food back into the front of my mind and dog health specifically so i am um, yeah i started just researching the market and was lucky enough to have a housemate living with me who was working at an agency that had access to you know those ibis you ever seen those ibis reports they're like big corporate analysis of particular marketing markets like pet food manufacturing pet food retail all that kind of stuff so I kind of like was able to download them and get a crash course in how the industry worked well, supply chains and market control and margins and all these kind of things uh, ownership and 
uh, where what parts of the markets were emerging and everything like that. And yeah, I, th- I actually thought most of it was bullshit, but it did have some really good like understanding the mechanics of old school industry and what was in retail stores was really, really useful. And then I kind of just, just toyed around with this idea. And then one day I said, look, I've got enough energy that's kind of like overflowing with energy to get into my own thing again. And I, I went to the place I was working at and said, look, I'm, um, I've got this business idea. I think like the business is in a pretty good place. You don't need me um, as much as you did when I joined. How about I move on in three months and start this business? And, uh, and then sort of like, it was kind of at that point an intention maybe to start a dog food brand. I thought there was an opportunity there. I thought that it was a really interesting market that one, I could do something so much better on a branding front, but that there was a much better product we could make if I made it direct to consumer and didn't have all the margins of selling through a retail store. And then, which for me, selling dog food made so much sense because I'm like, you're buying the same thing every time. You shouldn't have to pay 40, 50% markup just because it's going through a store, and particularly if the ingredients are sacrificed and the dog's health sacrificed. So I was convinced that like direct to consumer really worked for dog food, particularly if it's like annoying thing to buy heavy dog food. But hadn't really committed to the idea, but I knew I was going to do something. So I quit. And then like a week later, the business, like, all right, the business owner was basically like, all right, if you're out, you're out. Uh, and kind of shut me out of all the meetings and everything like that. And, and then said, oh, we, if, you're, if you're not part of the future, can you get out now? And then I, I'm like, okay, well, shit, okay. Uh, give me a week <laughs> um, to gather my thoughts. And, and then found myself having agreed because it was just, yeah, no one wants to sit there getting ignored from everything for a few months. So I um, yeah, found myself working the idea going, oh shit, well, I guess it's dog food pretty quickly after that. I guess it's funny how you look back and all the things that happened in life, it was awful at the time because I'd never, I guess, been shut out from anything and it was, you know, everything was going swimmingly until I said, no, I've got this idea. But um, it was really personally challenging, but I guess that was kind of, a, I guess, a bit of fuel in the fire to, to make a brand that would work and be worthy of my new unemployed time. Oh, it's such a shame, isn't it, that that experience. I've managed people before and I can imagine if someone came to me and said, look, I think this is where I'm heading. I'm giving you loads of notice. As a leader, I would have been like, wow, that takes guts and that gives time. And let me think about how to kind of do this practically and, you know, get the best handover I possibly can, make sure the tech, you know, like look at opportunities. Like, it's such a missed opportunity, I think, for, you know, for anyone who leads a person who says so openly, I've got this idea. This is where I'm, like, I'm heading. But like, I'm, I'm not quite ready to go yet. That's a real shame. It's a real missed opportunity to have spent three months teeing up the next person that would have taken on an evolutionary role or who knows, you know, and getting yourself ready. So I can, yeah, imagine that would have been pretty overwhelming to go well, financially. Now I'm facing no income. I'm not ready for this. Like, how am I going to make a dog brand that makes money in the next five minutes? That would have been pretty full on. What, what were your next few steps once you got out and you were on your own and you had nothing but time and nothing but, oh God, what's next? <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it quickly put me in this desperate position because yeah, I thought I would have three months of saving, three months of extra savings and I was going to be really scrupulous and, and then work out if it was a good idea because I hadn't done like any serious market analysis. Like it was just a I quit because I had the energy to do something. I thought there was roughly this opportunity that existed. It just had no like rigor. I'm like, oh, it's like three months to maybe figure it out whether that is what I'll do. And then, yeah, it just created this sense of desperation, I guess, which really didn't leave for a couple of years. It's that sent me in this path. I ended up like pretty chronically stressed for a couple of years there. But ultimately, like the scratch is around today probably because of that and because I was so probably desperate to, to prove it and make it happen. But it really started with like, I knew what I was good at and what I was interested in and wanted, I knew that if I was going to make a bit much healthier dog food, like it's dog's health at the end of the day that you're, that you're dealing with is a really serious thing. You can't just like spin up a, spin up an outsourced brand where you have no idea about what the product is. Like there's enough empty kind of Instagram brands out there. Like this had to be something that had rigor applied to the product and would like took the health side as seriously as possible. So I knew that I had no experience in dog health, in pet food, in manufacturing, in ingredient sourcing, in quality control, and all the things you want if you were to look after a dog's health for you know years and years and years and hopefully play a really good role in them having a long, healthy life. So the start of it was trying to find a business partner. Also knew that alone, you know, the entrepreneurship journey is really, really tough, and I wanted to be able to share in some, you know, share in that for better or worse with someone, like go through the hard stuff and kind of be able to support each other and, and be able to know that you've got someone you can count on for particular things that you struggle with. So yeah, I was that and surveying the market actually. Um, again, probably something I picked up from the entrepreneurship class of really understanding the market and knowing them. So 
I was doing some surveying with a friend who just moved back actually from San Francisco. She was in product management over there. So I loved surveying, loved really understanding customer insights. So we were surveying dog owners to understand how much they like their dog food, how often they've changed in the last however many years, how open they were to change. For instance, to know like, is it how, how much of an uphill battle is this convincing people to switch to this new dog food? Do they love their food? And actually her husband was there and was like looking at us doing all this surveying. It's like, oh, actually I know this guy who I did an MBA with, he ended up in the pet food industry, you should chat. And then just through like that, and that was like, you know, first two weeks probably. He's like, I chat to this guy. And then um, I'd, in the meantime, I'd been like looking on LinkedIn for people in supply chain roles at, I think Aussie Farmers Direct, they went under at that time. And I was like messaging everyone who'd just been made redundant from them to, who seemed like they had a, a role that might be relevant to say, hey, would you like to start this business with me, the stranger on the other end of this LinkedIn yeah. message? And thankfully, like I met a few of those people and they were great, but there was a lot of people who had families and like, hey, I'm not ready to be, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not ready to do this. I've got bills to pay and all of a sudden I'm redundant. But Doug um, was like, he had been working a really really prominent role within the industry, making a lot of products for a lot of the big guys, but hated basically like he was at the start of, Hey, this is what it could be. And then also managing production through to the end of like, this is what it ended up as now. Can you guys go and make it? And he was getting really fed up with basically how cost driven everything was uh, and price squeezed everything was, and particularly how that affected ingredients and ultimately health. So he was actually about to quit the industry altogether. And we just got introduced at the right time, had a call where I picked his brain and tried to learn as much as possible, but really suss out is this guy does he know what he's talking about is he good to work with is he uh what sort of attitude does he have towards the industry and life and business and all those kind of things and then emailed him afterwards and said yeah thanks so much by the way do you want to start a company with me and yeah we had we actually we had one beer and a coffee and then he quit his job and agreed to start scratch with me there is so much about that sharing that I love in terms of setting the bar or having the bar set just that little bit too high for yourself in terms of like, well, now you don't have a job. So yay, you know, Mm -hmm. that bar bar is up there. So you've got to kind of rise to meet the occasion, but also getting started without knowing exactly where you're going to end up and just tackling one thing at a time. What can you control right now? As you say, insights from the industry culturally and customer wise and bringing that together and that then leads to something else. It's it's a it's an approach I try not to make too woo woo because I think like, you know, not everybody is comfortable with that. But I think just so many people have this experience in business, but don't necessarily talk about it because they try to make it look perfectly planned and business planned and yay. And look what I did now. Like in retrospect, (laughs) it was so perfectly planned, but actually it's just by taking the steps and going through that, that person, that Doug was revealed and, you know, you knew where to head to next and then everything else starts to kind of map out from there. Not perfectly, I imagine, but just bit by bit, it starts to come together. So yeah, I just didn't want to let that go by without, being excited about that part of your story, which is just, you know, you get something started and you are allowed to just see where it goes. You don't have to know everything about supply chain, building, supply, uh, sourcing, packaging, logistics, tax, import tax, if there's any import, local, you know, like all of that stuff that can be your undoing as you go. You don't have to know that up front. You can tackle one thing at a time and ask Google as many times as you need to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you've got a problem, motivation, and yeah, and self-belief. I think uh, those three things really can combine. Like if a problem you understand better than anyone else and motivation to solve it, like self-belief to get through the hard parts, um, like most things will work out in some way or another. Self-belief is a really interesting one. You know, I think it's so difficult to separate from self-worth as well on, on these journeys. And I think for a lot of us, it's one of the biggest challenges to overcome, which is, you know, I am capable, both capable and worthy of, of seeing this through. Did you have to work on any of that element, the self-belief part or the, you know, the self-trust, the self-worth? What was that journey like for you? I've always had a lot of self-belief that I can do whatever and figure stuff out. I think particularly like that, and that was something that was probably cemented through that consulting where it is every brief you're getting is like, I don't know this business, I don't know this industry, but someone is paying me to figure it out. And so you're sort of teaching yourself to learn and then apply knowledge. And so when I think that it's a really good practice to have done consulting prior to then going into starting a business because everything is like, oh, here's a brief or here's a problem, work it out. Uh, and consulting is essentially getting paid to do that all the time. So it kind of instilled something that maybe was there a little bit, that maybe my parents something, maybe my parents did well, my schooling did well to help me have this natural base. 
but I was also like very insecure in in and shy like I was a shy kid then at the point of I guess starting scratch still like had never still had this point to prove kind of chip on my shoulder particularly after the how the, the job wrapped up so quickly with the business owner kind of just saying all right if you if you're not here you're out I was like definitely looking back like there was a I'm going to show him and them and everyone that I can make this opportunity amazing and that people love my brand and, you know, like that I'll be loved because people love my brand, all this messed up psychological stuff, I'm sure. But um, so at the same point, I believed in myself, but I really wanted to show the world. So there was a lot of ego in kind of like that. And that, that made it hard for me personally, but also fueled a lot of what has got me to this point anyway. My regular listeners will know this about me. Like, There's always a point in every conversation I'm privileged to have and to share here that is a real lander. Like it's just one of those little golden nuggets that land for me too. And I think it's you know around that proof points of self and how those previous proof points of what you've been able to problem solve when you haven't known how to in the first instance, that all of those proof points then come into play here. You're like, well, yeah, I don't know how to do this yet. But remember that thing I also didn't know how to do over there or felt overwhelmed by that then produced something something amazing at the end of it you know I, I had that experience working in my media career where somebody important you know would say to me we have to go to market in three days with a, a way to make ourselves stand out and to essentially sell more advertising go and I'd be <laughs> yeah. like what is that as a brief you know but you get through it and you create something and even if it's not perfect in the first round it's great in the second round it's perfect in the third round and you get to that end goal so I'm sure so many of us have had that experience I'm not a parent but I certainly imagine that there's a lot of nerves coming into parenting and then lo and behold the parent parents really well (laughs) and it happens it's about finding those proof points that you can actually do the hard things and and even if you don't know how to do the actual task uh, that's in front of you right now it's um yeah it's a really interesting one I think that might be the golden nugget for me so thank you for sharing it <laughs> no worries and I, I, like i definitely believe it doesn't have to be just being entrepreneurship or say some like something as big and amazing as parenting but like even and even now as a as a manager of, of people you know where you know we're talking about five years ago when we weren't paying ourselves for ages and that we had no employees and all that but now it's you know, I've got the chance as, a, as someone who owns a business and manages people to be able to do that in a pure manager employee kind of like level of showing someone, giving someone an opportunity and showing them belief and a path to doing something that they weren't sure about that all of a sudden like a light bulb switches, go, oh, I can do that. And then seeing them next time problem solve themselves and just like have that self-belief is, is the coolest thing. So I think it's something like if you have it, like I'm, I'm a fair believer in really, really good managers and people taking managing seriously and it's uh, you know because it is a privilege to be able to like unlock that in people so hopefully there's enough good managers out there that are motivated enough to not just do it for themselves but to do it for others and seek out the greatness of others too. Uh, It just is so wonderful to hear. I I can't be credited with this, but I've seen somebody say when you become a manager of people, you don't go up a level quote unquote if you're in a corporate environment, you actually take on a new profession. It's an entirely new career to the one that you have been doing previously. If you're in marketing and then you become a people leader, you are now a people leader who also knows how to do marketing. It is a, an entirely different thing that's not about self. It's always about others. And yeah, so it's probably not as many people that have that um, belief that you just described. <laughs> Hopefully there will be more. And I imagine if someone comes to you deciding to start a hair care brand or a, a cat food brand, you'll probably be very supportive um, of that person. What was that like taking on team members? And how did you know when to take on team members in terms of your scalability of the company? Yeah, I think in most e-commerce brands probably end up it's customer services the first first place. So that was we were no different. It was probably a year and a bit in, I think, that we had our first employee, and that was just to be able to deal with. Fortunately, we had customers, and we had, I guess, plans for other products and building out a team and raising a bit of money and and things like that. So you know, I needed time from somewhere, and customer service was quickly taking maybe half of my time. So it started there. I think our second person was this big kind of like ambitious hire of like a head of media to build out this like media arm, which is going to be we're like, we don't want to advertise on Facebook. Let's just like make our own content about dogs. And so there was this big shiny object kind of like goal. So we hired that, um, got someone really amazing, then hired head of creative. And then I think it was the next few were customer service people as well. But it, it, look, it was hard, particularly personally having to 
yeah, I was stressed not paying us. Like we didn't pay ourselves at all for like the first 18 months, I think. And then it was like 20 grand a year. And so it was like, you're doing freelancing on the side to pay the bills and trying to figure out so many business problems and unlock, you know, get to a point where the business is viable. Because if, if I cast my eye back now, like there were so many times, well, most of that first few years were like, okay, well, we've got customers and we're growing and maybe it's growing month on month, but we're still a long way from a viable business. <laughs> We're still like not sure if people would invest in this if we need more money. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of like problem solving and self-doubt and you're just emotionally pretty full from trying to do freelancing, being stressed, trying to prove this idea works. And then all of a sudden you've got to give your time to people that you're managing, teach them, give them room, be a calm, supportive, well-communicated kind of person while you are just like overflowing and stress <laughs> from trying to make it all work at the same time. So I think that kind of like giving your energy while you're, while you're in a tough place yourself was really, really hard. And then I think we sort of got to this moment where I think that this business has legs and we, we ended up having one or two lucky things with like PR where we overnight grew another stage in business because we got enough PR that like we had a crazy week of sales and you know we, have a good, we had really good dog food that people stuck around. It was like, we knew if, if they signed up that they were gonna stick around because the food was so much better than what was out there. Dogs were getting healthier. People were jumping on Instagram and sharing how great it was and and there was this really good advocacy. So we had this like overnight step and then we were able to go out and say, oh, cool, we're at this size, we're growing at this, let's, you know, we're, we're not asking for much money. We don't want to raise much. We, we don't want to do the venture capital thing. We want to be a bit more of a small business and a bit more of that bootstrap mindset. So uh, we were able to like raise, I think we raised about $600,000, maybe this would have been about two years into the business then. And then from that moment, we were like, okay, we're, we're fine. We believe in this business and kind of like the stress level went from here to here. It was like a seven instead of a 10. And then from there, like managing became a lot easier because I was personally in a better, better place to do it. And then probably maybe about four years in, we then had managers. Then it might be like a head of creative managers, a few people, and then a head of customer service managers, a few people. And it's not like, it's not on you to do everything. So kind of like this step-by-step -step approach, but um, it was definitely tricky early on. Yeah, that kind of surge and chill, surge and chill, you know, to some degree just becomes the norm, I guess, from from what you've just shared. That's what it sounds like it's been. I'm just so grateful, though, that you shared the story of freelancing in those early days to make ends meet. It's like that's reality. That's literally what we have to do in most instances to actually make money to pay the bills and also build a business. And I think it's an area that a lot of us will skim over or not promote or not talk about because it's not it's not as sexy as just being like yeah shit it was hard and like for three years I built this business but now it's surging and now I'm getting revenue and now I'm reinvesting but it's like you actually do have to find ways to pay the bills through that and sometimes that requires you to do the unthinkable which is think about somebody else's business <laughs> just like how on earth am I going to squeeze this into my brain to think and help somebody else while also trying to build this thing myself yeah yeah absolutely no it's um the, per the personal side of starting business is, is so tricky and impacts so much about what you're like to work with and how well you can problem solve and if you'll even last, you know, because, you know, it is a lot of people, it might not be the business idea that they've got, they're just timing and where they are personally might impact whether it's right for them or not. And everything can have its time. You can pick it back up in a few years if it's if it's got legs. No work is ever, ever wasted. I know I started exploring an e-com brand last year and invested just a small amount into it. I think, it, you know, just enough to get a, a formulation for a product that I wanted to create and you know, then realized, shit, this timing actually couldn't be worse. And I think I'm exploring this to distract myself from the other things that I'm meant to be building. <laughs> and, you know, so you put that down and go, okay, well, that might come back again later on. That might become important in, in a little while. But um, yeah, it's a really good point. Uh, you mentioned there seeking investment. It would be remiss of me not to point out that one of your investors is the one and only Mick Fanning, which is fantastic <laughs> and a very cool proof point in the success of your business and the you know potential growth of, of your business. So talk to me about what that experience was like, you know, raising capital, but also having that person be Mick bloody Fanning. Yeah, no, that was like, that was surreal because actually, I actually don't think I've told him this because he'd prob it'd probably be, so I'm not sure if you can hear my dog barking in the background, he's all of a sudden gone nuts. I can, I've been hearing mine snoring outside the door. So I'm hopeful you haven't heard that. <laughs> I have not. No, look, it was really surreal uh, getting Mick as an investor and, and being part of it because funnily enough, when, when I wrote the brief for us to kind of like formulate our tone of voice, Mick Fanning was the reference of like, if, we, if Scratch was a person 
who would it be? Like someone who takes what they do really seriously, but is also quietly confident, casual, approachable, not trying to speak down at you for, for anything in particular. Like we knew how confusing the dog food industry is and like the labeling and the transparency around it is so bad. Like it's so impossible for anyone to go to a dog food store and work out what's healthy looking at the back of a packet. It's not like human food where you can see full transparency on the amount of ingredient, you know, amount of different ingredients and even carbs and things like that. They're not on labels. So we thought, yeah, someone like him who was, you know, not afraid to say what he doesn't know, but clearly has like wanted to do things at a high level, had a really nice, cheeky Australian tone of voice. He was kind of like out, if Scratch was a person, who would it be? That was, that was me. And then uh, I actually knew, I knew someone who was really close to him, had a, had a long history with him um, and was actually spending a bit of time looking after his dog every now and then when he, you know, he was on the World Surf Tour and everything like that, winning titles as you do, punching sharks when you need to. <laughs> And, uh, and he kind of gave me an introduction to him to just like send him over some food. And the whole time I'm like, I would love him to invest. Didn't tell him, didn't tell him that, but just like, okay, I'll send him some products, see if, see if he likes it, see if his dog reacts well to it. Cause his dog Harper had like chronic skin issues and really would struggle to kind of like get on top of them. So I sent him over some of our original kangaroo recipe, which we still sell to this day. It does wonders for dogs with like chronic skin and tummy issues. And it did really, really well. And he was like, oh, this is amazing. And so I went up to the Gold Coast next time. I was catching up with a friend and then said, oh, do you reckon Mix is around? Would love to meet him and his dog. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I'll get in, a, get in to say hi and come by. So I had just like a, a quick chat and probably two or three times kind of over the next, over that first two years, kind of just met him for five minutes kind of thing. Chatted about, oh, hey, how's it going? It's always like interesting to how the business is going. We'll talk about how it's going for Harper. And then one time I'm like, oh, we're, I think we're going to raise a bit of money soon if you ever like, want to invest in anything like that i can send you some information he's like oh yeah maybe and then uh i followed up with my mate and said oh what was your read on that and he's like oh i think uh, you know i think he doesn't like you know he's busy he's he's just super busy he's like he doesn't like people imposing stuff on him i'm like i would 100 percent get that i can only imagine and then um yeah and then kind of one day saw him again and then he was like oh yeah we just basically just got talking about the business and how it was going and he was like oh shit okay well, wow this is not, it's not just working for Harper, it's working for lots of dogs. And okay, I might be interested, send him over some stuff. And he's like, yeah, that's great, let's do it. And it all then came really, really simply. Like once he kind of understood the industry, like we just had a few chats where he just understood enough about the industry and had seen the product work for himself and yeah, became an investor. And then I think we got on the front cover of the Harold Sun when he invested. So all of a sudden, yeah, he's invested this little bit of money in Scratch, amazing really great validation for us and really exciting but it just turned into this giant pr thing and then we chucked it on facebook and then the ads just like we'd never done facebook advertising before but then the ads were working incredibly well and yeah we we're um yeah it just uh kind of transformed our business really that's incredible there's just so much to be said there for comfortably nurturing a relationship with a holding a dream in your mind but also not having that hardcore intention to be like okay I'll go meet with this person now and then I'll plant this seed and then I'll do this and then you know that uh, I see sometimes that approach with networking or building or seeking investment or seeking partnership or collaboration it feels very forced and planned like if it's meant to be for you it's meant to be for you you just got to approach these things with that let's just throw stuff out there be a good person be considerate to the context that the other person is working within and just see where it goes and then you know if and when it does happen it's just so naturally perfect and results in so much incredible opportunity and growth so it's just such a cool story and I think a lesson for a lot of us us that we might hold these dreams somewhere in the back of our mind and somewhere very high like they are achievable but also you do just have to remember at the end of the day you just create something that's good that is of value to your category your network your community whatever it is and then just see where it goes like just follow opportunities but without that expected outcome it's um i'm so happy for you that's such a a cool win and yeah it's so amazing to see that full circle your persona through to your investor like wild <laughs> yeah. No, we're very fortunate. And I mean, I don't know, I, he, I'm sure he must have been able to feel this, but like we never, we didn't do this with anyone else. It wasn't like we had this celebrity investment strategy where we're like, oh, we're going to get all these celebrities on board and get them to Instagram it and then whatever. Like we, it was, he was the only person we ever, like that I ever thought I would love him, him, him to invest. Like we hadn't gone out and tried to get investors to that point. I'm just like, no, he personifies so much of what we're trying to do. He loves the product, has worked for his dog. It would be great to have an investor. And I'm sure there are some great marketing opportunities in there. Having said that, like we haven't bothered him for years. Like we, we're very respectful of his time. So it's not like a, we're expecting of him. It was just like, all right, let's maybe do an initial thing. 
speak to the, speak to the Herald Sun, and that's it. And um, yeah, so it's, it's we've been super lucky. It's worked really well for both of us. But if I had been out, if I had have been really hungry to make that work, I probably would have scared him off. If I had been trying to like raise from all these different celebrities, he probably would have been like, oh, this is just like you're using me for whatever. Like it, the, I'm sure he would have picked up on the intention being very very different. And I'm sure maybe because everyone loves their dogs. Like we thought we, with our business, we had an unfair advantage and that everyone loves their dogs. It's a great conversation starter. Like I could talk with, you can talk with anyone about their dog. We all love talking about our dogs. And media loves talking about people's celebrities, cute dogs as well. So it's like, we had an unfair advantage, um, but yeah, it, it just all kind of came about. And he was just, he's been just so great to work with. And as, as you imagine, very, very chill about the business, but also super interested in particularly in what can help his dog. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm definitely going to be a customer once I get rid of my 13 kilos of unnecessarily purchased <laughs> bulk dry food. I might be, I was actually before preparing for this interview like, geez, how much do we have of that left? Can I just throw it out? Like, I mean, it's, you know, the best I could find at the time. But I'm like, now I found this incredible product. So um, yeah, you're right. We all love to treat our dogs with absolute care and do the best that we can for them. So it's a yeah, very cool category. What might have gone from a boring category to a very lovely one and a very interesting one. There's something you mentioned before in terms of hiring your head of content or your marketing person and how you approach marketing, which I find really interesting. And I have seen that you have launched a magazine and uh, are creating content that way. You have launched a podcast about puppy training and have created content and your marketing approach that way. I think it's a, a very interesting approach. It's most certainly, you know, content led marketing is most certainly my favored approach, creating something that is meaningful to your audience that allows you to naturally promote yourself, not hardcore flog yourself, is definitely my preferred um, approach <laughs> in that. So I'd like to talk, I guess, a little bit about how your expertise in marketing previously and what you brought from that into this content first approach, like how that sort of come about and what the experience was actually like creating them because yes ads absolutely play their part in a marketing plan be it meta or google or whatever we're doing content's a, a whole different beast so what was your experience like creating that content-led approach yeah look i think the journey of creating a brand that's like day one not, not a single person's heard about us through to five and a half years in where i think we're known by let's say close to 10 percent of dog owners in australia so we've still got a lot of room to do we're a small little company really in a really big category owned by like mars and nestle and all sorts of kind of multinationals. So, you know, we are a small brand, but we've, I think we've had ahead of our, our average here. I think I really came into marketing, brand building, very idealistic, kind of like, I'll prove that you can make a brand that doesn't rely on Facebook at all. And my, like, my goal was to be so good at marketing and content that we didn't need ads at all. And to be honest, like we've had to go back on that a little bit, particularly as the gatekeepers of the internet, Facebook and Google, deprioritize organic, a lot of so much organic content. We definitely ended up far more ad reliant than I thought we would. But having said that, most of our ads now come from a place of content first. Or if we think about creation, like we hired, we hired we've got a head of dog videos here at Scratch. Oh, and, what a gig. Yeah, it's tough, isn't it? And his role is essentially to make content for our socials that people would like and that hopefully if you know we get a good read on what has a little nugget of truth or interest in it that could be then able to be applied to an ad. So like we still use, I guess, content and making good content at the heart of all of our communication. Make something people would be interested in reading that values their time, that is fun and cheeky and light, but also informative and interesting and speaks to our view of life with dogs, they're awesome and you should take their health as seriously as you can. But also like we've got our own lives and sometimes you want convenience and sometimes you want all these things. So we're like, we're playing in this world of pretty balanced dog as a member of the family, but we're not like full dog obsessing over absolutely everything all the time. So that's influenced our strategy where half of our content is probably these days for more entertainment focus rather than pure education. Like we don't you know, we, all the science we know behind dog health, digestive system, all the things about nutrition, where it comes from, ways ingredients are sourced, all those kind of things are sort of like exist as internal knowledge now. We don't actually make that much content about it. Where we do make content is for people who seek out content. 
So mainly puppy owners. So a lot of our content these days is puppy owners because they're the people going to Google saying, how do I, what should I buy? Where, how do I do this? What is normal? How do I train my dog to do this? And once your dog reaches a certain age, we found that most people are like, great, my dog's the finished article. Or like, they are the way they are, they'll always be like that. And they sort of stop seeking out content. And yeah, there's so much more content we could make, but we sort of focus now on making content for people seeking it because you're not battling the algorithm so much then. And, uh, and then we're a small business, so everything's a trade-off. So we're like, all right, we'll make entertaining, and the rest of our energy, we'll make it into entertaining content that maybe can turn into ads. Because with ads, we can chuck media behind it to know that it's going to get seen. But again, it comes from this heart of what do people, what is interesting to the audience that we would love to share. I'm going to ask another question about content, but before I do, I, I didn't want to forget this. I feel like there's an Easter egg in your website. And so when you scroll down to the bottom and you've got the icons for your, you know, send off to Instagram, send off, there's like a devil icon and that links off to Facebook. Is that oh, intentional? What, a, what an accident. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no comment. That was probably one of the greatest Easter eggs I've ever discovered on someone's website. So thank you for that. I think it's highly entertaining and I can see why. <laughs> as part of that very cool stuff <laughs> but you know more so on that um the work that comes behind something like a magazine you know something that you can physically p- pick up and and I, you know, I love that insight that more people are researching and looking for content and information at puppy stage versus any other and I can absolutely see how that makes a difference to the life cycle of your customers as well in terms of as a small business like to how can you make this worthwhile as worthwhile as possible the physical act of creating something like a magazine and like a podcast series you know it comes with a lot of work and a lot of consideration Uh, so I'm interested I guess in your staying power in that how you like get the confidence to invest in this and then how you get that work out there so you know you put all this investment to make an incredible mag that you know people wouldn't find elsewhere how do you get it out there then yeah we did the the magazines I'll start with that so the magazines we did, like I often think about things in terms of energy and distribution. So like how much energy is this going to take? What distribution do I have to actually make good of that? So I can make something amazing but and it can spend so much time in it. But if I've got no easy way of sharing it, then what else am I relying on to share it? For the magazine, we did the first ever one when we did... The, um, there's this big show in well, around most states in Australia now called the Dog Lovers Show. And we did the Melbourne one. I think we were like a year in. We were struggling to grow. Like it was a lot slower than we expected. So we're like, we thought that we were basically not trusted yet because we were this little internet brand. Had got a little bit of PR, but like really no one had heard about us. Certainly no one had, you couldn't get samples anywhere. Like we didn't have a samples part of our website. So there would be people seeing the brand being a little bit interested but unable to like take that first step of like are these guys legit is the food any good so we spent like 20 grand at a big kind of like store at the dog lover show a really prominent location did a little bit of fit out and then we're like okay we've got all these people and we know that yes some of them will want samples so we made lots of samples but we thought for people who aren't so interested i just want to see what our view of dog food is like and just like want to understand the company or our view of the world. Let's make this content that they can just like pick up when they're just like walking by the stand and it's like low touch and they come home and they've got 15 dog food samples, but they've got this little magazine about dogs and maybe talks a little bit about transparency of the industry or this problem that they're not familiar with. So we made that there and we made about 2000 of them and distributed them all at that event. Yeah, which was really fun. I got like this old school like Harold Sun vending machine and then like painted that and filled it with all our like these newspapers that we made. It was more of a newspaper than a magazine. It was like a big gazette kind of thing. And then we had, I think the next year we were doing it again, um, Dog Lover Show again and uh, thought, okay, let's do, a, let's do a round two. And let's, uh, by that point, we'd actually made this magazine, online magazine called Off the Leash which actually I think I did at the start of the original magazine and was the original newspaper. And it was like, if you like this, then go to this website. We're going to put all this content on there as well. And because we weren't making many sales, we weren't running Facebook ads. We had one product for like the first two years. Most of our time early on was actually creating content and putting it on off the leash and kind of taking this bet in content marketing and trying to work out SEO at the same time and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, we, for the second Dog Lover Show, we made a second edition of this. And by now we actually had a bunch of customers. So like we made a part of our website where you could add it to your next order if you wanted it, it was free. So we sort of used it as this like customer advocacy kind of thing. 
we sent it out to people who we thought like were in the space or who were interested in working with us in the future or we wanted to work with them or we just admired them or whatever. It was sort of like a really soft way of introducing ourselves. And we did, it was like off the leash by scratch. So it wasn't like a, it was clearly not an ad, like it looked a lot more like content. It was designed to be something you'd pick up. If you're a dog owner, you could pick it up and it wouldn't have, it wouldn't feel like you're getting a commercial message put down your throat by any means. Just really good content that made, uh, made you trust Scratch a little bit more or familiar with Scratch. So yeah, it was a, it was a really good thing to have done. Look, they did take a lot of time and energy, a little bit of money, uh, particularly, you know, early days. And we haven't done them since because we stopped doing those events for various reasons and sort of like, we, so we don't have the same distribution anymore of giving out a physical magazine as what we, what we did back then. But still love, I love the format. I particularly love them early on magazine formats because they're such an intentional thing where... It really, like the whole team got a lot out of putting their heart and soul into something that people can see in a single object and everyone can get involved in it. It's not just like packaging design people and the food and product design people. It's like everyone get, gets to contribute to this in some way or another and hand it out and absorb this information. And there's design in there, but there's also content. There's like funny stuff, silly stuff, everything like my business partner's dog, he had a horoscope section where he gave horoscopes to other dogs and like it was just a bunch of silly stuff too. So everyone everyone got a lot out of it internally. Yeah, so a lot of effort. And then the podcast came about because I was getting a, I was getting a puppy and I'm like, oh, I'm going through all this stuff where I'm the first dog I've had for 10, 15 years. I'm learning all this stuff. I'm going through all these challenges. How, how about if we did this out loud? So partnered up with um, Sophie from So Help Me Dog, who's an amazing dog trainer uh, that we had a bit to do with and just chatted about like, all the bro- broke down puppy development and training into 10 different steps and just like podcasts the, the journey and that was that was something i wish i knew more about podcast production and was able to do it a little bit better or a lot better than what we did but hopefully there's a, plenty of good nuggets in there and we designed that one because we felt again like we knew that so many people were doing research in the puppy stage and we'd I'd gone in google and keyword trending and and all the various SEO tools to work out what were the volume levels of different searches for different things and found out, yeah, a lot of searches happen at that puppy stage. And so we did the podcast because it was a really good evergreen content method. Whereas like some things we did that are like fleeting, a bit more news-based and like it's got a week a week to last or maybe a month from the homepage and then it filters down to page two and you never get seen again. But this was like people are going to be getting puppies forever and this information probably the bulk of it should be really relevant forever. And if someone signs up for Scratch, even if it's not a sales tool, but like they've signed up for Scratch, they've got a puppy, we can give them this information and we can be really useful. And we just have to do it once and it's like super evergreen. So like for me, I look back and go, one, it helped me work out a lot of puppy stuff because I was able to get Sophie's help. But I think it really continues to help a lot of puppy owners just like work out the mess and the complexity of puppy training because puppies are hard work man they grow up so quickly that you're getting like years of human parenting like condensed into this small little small little zone as puppies grow up so quickly so yeah super interesting and it still provides value to us like a year and a half on oh i just love so much about like that is how you do it yeah off the leash by scratch creating something in the podcast space that's evergreen that you can provide value to ensuring that it's built on a cultural insight of what do people need and how can I provide value over how can I make something that's going to a become my entire world and be another entire brand that I'm trying to build like it's there's just so much there that is so valuable in terms of a learning and such a great way to approach these huge initiatives of, of creating anything. And yeah, I love hearing about the the tactile nature of, you know, making it like a newspaper, making it like, we don't do enough of that sort of stuff. You know, that that is a brand experience that stays with you. And at that very important stage of raising a puppy, somebody who is finding your podcast and then listening to it, like you're part of that journey, like you're embedded in there, you're in there and it's for them. It's not for you it is for scratch like it has marketing benefits of course of course it does but it's not for you it's for the listener and that's exactly how you do podcasts in the branded podcast space it's just i mean my listeners will know i'm obsessed with branded podcasts because it's what i consult on and it's it's you know how i help brands do it but that is absolutely you know a fantastic way to do it and, and evergreen like you say yeah it doesn't have to be something that you update week on week forever more create great content once and you know for anyone who's listening as well you can actually do an entire series quote unquote podcast series eight 10 episodes drop the whole lot at once market it <laughs> you don't have to just be like a podcaster for the next eternity so it's very no, you're not cool. committing forever no. like some things work really well and just in just a season format even just one yeah. season absolutely yeah it can just exist i mean how many great tv shows have we watched 
and they only last for one season. It's <laughs> white lotus aside, like that needs to just be forever and a day, keep coming back, keep <laughs> coming back. But there are a lot that adjust meant to exist in, in one season. So yeah, it's a it's an awesome share. Thank you. Where do you hope to see Scratch grow over the next couple of years? Well, our goal is definitely to be Australia's most trusted dog food company. I think we are, like a, I hope we are amongst people who know about us. Like I said, we're still around that 10% mark of brand awareness. So I just want to keep just keep doing things our way slowly. If that grows up to 15, 20% of dog owners who know about us, then I'll be I'll be stoked. And hopefully, you know, our job is then just to keep doing the best products as possible and do them with as much reliability and quality as possible. And that that's kind of it. Just keep feeding great dogs and just sort of like doing it our way bit by bit. We're definitely like a flow is steady, steady is fast over time kind of kind of brand. So yeah, just make great products, make great dogs, earn their trust, deserve their trust. And I'm sure it'll all work out if we do that. And could there be a better business plan really than that just to make great things um, and help people and put value out into the world? It's awesome. You have shared so much great insight today and so many valuable learnings and points for entrepreneurs, fellow small business owners at any stage of the journey, whether they're getting started or are right in there. You know, in particular, I think the the energy around you know, having an idea and, and seeing it through and allowing it to unfold and, and allowing yourself to take risks and, and know that things are coming through right through to the, you know, the content marketing approach and the energy around that. Just so many valuable learnings. So I'm super grateful for you sharing them with me today. So thank you. In return, how can the listener and I support you to grow and to start making more healthier doggos? in the world uh well if you've got a dog uh, you can check out our food at scratchpetfood.com.au we do free samples we've got 100 percent money back if you're interested to try it but not really sure how your dog will go with the new food we're there we're on live chat if you just want to send photos of your dog and talk to us about their health so yeah probably our website's the best place or at world of scratch on instagram if you just want to look at people's cute dogs and some of our products Yes, absolutely. I'm going to make sure all those links are in there. I'll also put off the leash and the pod in there as well as awesome resources as well. And it will be showing Ruby Lou, my pug, the <laughs> Instagram page ASAP <laughs> so she can go wild at it and bark because no other dog can come into our life um, or our TV or our screens at any time. But <laughs> it has been awesome chatting with you today. And yeah, just thank you again for sharing and uh, wish you all the best. Thanks for joining me. Thanks, Kim. Great to chat. Thank you for listening to Unemployed and Afraid, the podcast for small business builders with your host, me, Kim Curtin. If you love it, you can say thanks with a star rating and a review. And of course, join the community on Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Find us at Unemployed and Afraid wherever you're hanging out and I'll see you there.